Again, we are so happy to uh, receive Mr. Dale Verstegen as our speaker this afternoon. Dale is a senior research associate and is assigned to a range of research, training, and technical assistance projects in various parts of the country. Dale has over 30 years of experience providing training, consultation, and project management for state vocational rehabilitation agencies throughout the country. He provides consultation and training in the areas of program development, performance management, marketing, job development, supported and customized employment, and case management, and has developed curriculums and provided trainings on supported and customized employment for a wide range of state agencies and organizations. Describing himself as someone who can't sit still, Dale loves to travel for work and for pleasure, listening to live music, riding his motorcycle, sailing and boating, and watching sports. He grew up in Wisconsin and still loves and still lives there today and would be happy to live there forever in Madison, specifically as long as he can live frequently in the winter. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Okay, slide 11. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Dale Verstegen. And uh, Daryl, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, the, the one uh, thing I'd correct in my, uh, <laughs> in my bio is it did say uh, that I'd like to leave uh, Wisconsin periodically during the winter months because uh, uh, some of you may, may be aware it gets kind of cold up here. Uh, but thank you so much for uh, joining this webinar. And, uh, and uh, uh, this is the second in a series of three. And I was told that some of you have signed up for this webinar uh, and had not been uh, involved in, or participated in the first one. So we will spend a, a few minutes uh, kind of recapping uh, what we, we covered in that first webinar um, so, so that it will help kind of get you up to speed. Uh, uh, but for today, uh, we, uh, we want to talk about approaching employers confidently, uh, conducting informational interviews and determining labor needs, building rapport with employers, and then the, the, the study that, that a lot of this material is based on uh, had some recommendations that are related to developing uh, long-term partnerships with uh, employers. So that's, that's our focus today. Uh, uh, slide 12. So again, I mentioned that the information that we're sharing in this webinar series is based on a study that uh, I was able to participate in uh, through the Department of Labor Office on Disability Employment Policy. And uh, as you can see uh, in terms of what the slide says, the objective of the study was to gain that perspective from employers uh, related to employing uh, persons with disability, uh, particularly those folks that have more significant barriers to employment. Uh, and it did give us some really good information about their perspective on your the employment programs that we offer them, uh, and specifically uh, uh, their perspectives on uh, the use of customized employment. Uh, slide 13. So when and this was a study that we did in 2018, and uh, we defined economic impact as that measure of an estimate or describing the changes that took place once uh, an employment program that uh, such as what you might uh, represent uh, was was uh, conducted. Uh, and services were provided uh, to specific employers. Uh, that being a, an event, uh, being in other words, you being on site and working with those particular employers. And then what we got out of that was the measure, estimate, or descriptions of the economic activity that took place and, and then how they perceived 
those services that you received, uh, that they received from you. Uh, and again, uh, this, this particular study was conducted in the state of Iowa and in the state of Maryland. Uh, slide 14. So there was a selection uh, criteria that we used uh, to determine whether an employer was uh, uh, eligible for the study. And so they needed to have an uh, experience in operational and economic benefit uh, and, and kind of acknowledge that. Yeah, I work with a local employment provider, and I did find it beneficial. Uh, and that that uh, employer worked directly with one or more uh, service provider uh, who did represent empl potential employees with a disability, and that they had had some, and that they'd had some experience with a customizing a job within their organization, and that the person that was involved in the focus groups or the interviews that we conducted for the study played a major role in hiring and approving uh, the placement of a person with a disability within their employer site. And and even though some of you may have heard this from the first. Uh, webinar. I wanted to have that in here again this time because of those questions that I asked in the beginning. Did you get some customized employment training? And sounded like most of you had. And uh, what sort of placements might you have had with customized employment? Because this selection criteria is something that we want you to pay attention to. Who, who uh, within your communities, uh, what employers within your communities, do you have a working, ongoing working relationship with? And within that working relationship, how many uh, employers might you say uh, you've worked with that uh, have uh, been, you've been able to place somebody using customized employment practices and principles? Uh, because the third of these three webinar series that we're doing, uh, which will take place um, on August 6th, is going to be specifically about how you can, in fact, uh, um, conduct some of these interviews and maybe even a focus group within your, uh, with, the, with the employers that you work with. And some of this economic impact information that we're getting, uh, you could get for yourself. And we think that this can be very beneficial to you. Uh, and that's a lot of what I hope you're going to hear today on this webinar is how and why conducting such a interview or a focus group with the employers that you work with could benefit you in terms of expanding partnerships with additional employers that you might work with uh, over time. So uh, next slide, for, uh, 15, please. So this was just give you an idea of the uh, uh, type of employers that we were able to work with for the study. Um, and then you can see it's a mix of uh, manufacturers, uh, uh, health care providers, retailers. Uh, so it was a nice mix of large and small uh, types of businesses in different uh, types of industries. Um, and there's a picture uh, with that of a, of a, of a person uh, kind of going through some materials that kind of simulating if we are working with them on an ongoing basis. Uh, next slide, 16, please. So the character, and this is also uh, what I think you should pay attention to when you think about the employers that, uh, that you're working with. Um, uh, because these, these are what the characteristics we found to be common across the employers that participated in our study that they had worked with more than one, one or more providers, uh, that they understood the concepts of customized employment and the importance of matching uh, to the jobs uh, that they have. Uh, and what we found is the people that were willing to uh, participate in the study tended to be people who had a strong uh, interest and commitment to hiring folks with disabilities. They found it beneficial, and they're willing to talk about it, and they're willing to talk to others about it. Uh, so, so I think what happens is what we're learning is that after you develop that relationship with that employer, uh, it's something that we can take more and better advantage of longer term uh, because we now have these internal champions. And the working relationship with those employers uh, changes. You don't have to uh, get involved with the cold calling and the maybe even the 
the, the type of uh, interview, informational interviews that, that, that you had to do before you had this working relationship with that particular employer. Uh, it can be more there looking for opportunities and bringing those to, to us as employment providers. Uh, and that they adopted, and then a lot of them, what we found, had adopted some sort of quality improvement process. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, during the course of this webinar. And then there's a couple of pictures of employers, uh, uh, one involved with uh, 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 the building trades uh, and the other person uh, kind of working on some high-tech manufacturing type of, of equipment. Slide 17. And this is the last slide that will kind of be a summary of the of the first webinar. But it but I wanted to kind of because there are some folks that are on this webinar that weren't able to participate in the first one, uh, is is the findings of the study uh, b by talking to these employers uh, indicated that in fact they had reduced costs uh, for recruiting, hiring, and training through working with an organization such as yours. That when we do a good job of learning standard labor needs, uh, placing people into those uh, businesses, that's less employees that they have to recruit, hire, and train. And so they were able to put a monetary benefit uh, in terms of those reduced costs that they have. And that there was reduced turnover and absenteeism, particularly when we had strong uh, uh, matching to the to the jobs, those folks tended to stay, and it also had a positive impact on their culture, and affected the retention positively affected the turnover and retention of the employees who did not have a disability because of the support that they felt that they were getting, particularly through those customized jobs. There were opportunities to expand placements, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today and opportunities for advancement of employees with disabilities, uh, and that there was an increased product, uh, level of productivity, uh, particularly through customized employment. Um, there were a lot of questions that came in uh, through the last webinar, and I really want to strongly encourage you on this webinar to do the same. Uh, enter those questions into the chat box. We weren't able to get to all the questions, but I was able to respond to all of those questions, and it, and you can go back. Uh, there are links provided to you uh, through recent emails that you can go back into our, our to the website and download those uh, questions and the and, and my responses to those questions. And and several of the questions uh, asked about customized employment. Uh, because uh, employers are talking about having folks come in doing those lower skilled tasks and they're worried about or had con they were asking questions about, you know, does that mean that these em these employees are, are only there to do the grunt work or doing just the low skilled types of jobs? And, and that really wasn't the case with the employers that we talked to. As a matter of fact, they talked about once those folks came in, uh, is that they would advance them in terms of number of hours, uh, skills that they acquired, uh, and in some cases, actual promotion to uh, uh, higher level jobs uh, once we were able to kind of place them and once they were effectively matched and supported in those jobs. Slide 18. So what we're going to cover in terms of findings uh, 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 this time, which were which I didn't cover in in the first webinar, was but it, but were conclusions and findings of our of our study, was they were giving us some some really good information about how best to approach them, and build rapport, uh, the the importance of understanding what quality improvement processes are. You don't have to be an expert in this area, but you have to know what it is. And it's important to understand if the employers that you're working with uh, are also aware and are incorporating quality improvement processes. Uh, several of the more popular ones that are used by uh, businesses uh, is ISO uh, 2 and 3000, uh, LEAN, L-E-A-N. Um, uh, so, so, and there are others. Uh, but but it's important to know if they do use those that type of methods to improve their their operations and make them more efficient. Uh, because if they do, what we're finding and what employers are telling us is that they also have a, a good understanding and can relate 
really well to the concepts of customized employment. And then they talked a lot about the importance of mitigating risk, that the perception of risk is real, that these folks are from a protected class. Uh, their perceptions of them in terms of having a disability can uh, erroneously be that there's higher risks in terms of safety and liability when it comes to hiring individuals with disabilities. Uh, so we have to address those issues, address their concerns, mitigate uh, uh, th their perceptions of risk. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well during this webinar. Uh, slide 19. So there's a woman talking on a phone. And the question says, you've made contact. What will you say? So this is the part of the webinar where we're going to talk about how best to approach. And if you're, if you're uh, experienced in terms of job development, uh, this may be redundant for you. Uh, but I'm also going to make the assumption that there's some folks that are new uh, or newer in their job as a, as a job developer working with employers. So uh, uh, please go to slide 20. So we want to spend a little bit about what is the best way to approach them. So you have two options here, uh, innovative staffing resource or assisting people with disabilities to achieve employment. So my question to you um, is, which of those is the best when it comes to starting a conversation uh, with an employer in terms of defining your role, what it is you do, who you are? So uh, go ahead and advance it. So as you can see, what we recommend is you define yourself as an innovative staffing resource. That's how we feel they, the employer sees you. Uh, and if they see you as assisting people with disabilities achieve employment, that may or may not have anything to do with them. Um, they may say, well, that's nice that you assist people uh, to achieve uh, disabilities, achieve employment. But when it comes to what, it, it, what you have to offer employers and how to define your services when you're talking to employers, an innovative staffing resource is really uh, what employers tell us is the most effective way to define yourselves. Uh, slide 21. Similarly, you have... Uh, the ability in terms of an opening, uh, in terms of when you're starting to talk to an employer. And this can be in a networking situation or actually asking for an informational interview. Uh, and when you're asking for an informational interview, uh, is it best to say, I'd like to learn more about your company? Or is it best to say, do you have any jobs or any job openings? So think about that for a second. And what would you say? Please advance the slide. What we find to be most effective is when you say, I'd like to learn more about your company. Versus, because, because uh, first of all, do you have any jobs or any job openings? That's a yes, no question. And so if they say no, where do you go from there? The other main point about this is when you're first starting to approach an employer, talking about filling specific jobs is, as far as we're concerned, inappropriate. Your main role is to learn about them, their business, and then make a determination as to do they have any openings and may we have somebody that could help fill uh, the type of jobs that they have openings for. And of course, with customized employment, we're not even filling posted jobs. So again, uh, not the right question. Do you have any jobs or job openings? Uh, so that's our main reason to contact them. That's our main reason in terms of defining ourselves as an innovative staffing resource is we want 20 to 25 minutes of your time to conduct an informational interview. Um, uh, slide 22. So in terms of a script, we, we do recommend, especially if you're new, at talking to employers or trying to get informational interviews, uh, we think it's best to kind of have a good strategy. You don't have to have a script where you say something word for word like this is, but we want you to have a good idea of what you're going to say before you say it. 
Uh, and that's important because then you're not going to stumble over your words. You're going to sound more confident. Uh, and, and you're going to be clear about why it is you're talking to this particular employer. So as you, and I'm not going to read all this to you, but you can see the key points in here are who we work with. It's job seekers. It doesn't have to be about whether they have a disability or not. We're interested in their industry. And we'd like to uh, uh, come to talk to them and to learn about the skill sets needed to do the skill sets needed to do this kind of work. Uh, it's about their about them. It's about learning about who they are as an employer, and it's learning about what they require in the jobs and and the ability to get the work out that that particular employer has. That's our reason to approach these employers. That's our reason to schedule these informational interviews. It's not to tell them all about our services. It's not really to recommend specific employees. Uh, you have to learn about their business and their needs before talking about the possibility of placing somebody that might be on your caseload. Uh, in slide 23. Slide 23 has a woman talking on a phone, and uh, it, it says, uh, I'm really interested in your industry. Is it possible for me to visit and learn more about your company to better meet some of your labor needs? So it is, we're not promising anything. We're not, we're not clear about how it is we might be able to benefit them. So don't guess. Don't tell them you may be able to help them and how you might be able to help them. Uh, the main thing that you want to do is, is make the case for, if you spend 20, 25 minutes of, of your time with me, I will learn more about what you look for with the employees that you have. And I may be able uh, to address some of your labor needs, but I won't know until I have a chance to learn more about you and your company. Uh, we feel that's a very reasonable ask. Makes it easier for them to say yes. The more we talk about disability and our services and the some of the possible job seekers, uh, when they're not in a position to really make any decisions about any of that, uh, it tends to confuse the issue. It actually makes it harder for us to get in to do informational interviews and start that process of developing a relationship and a rapport with employers. Slide 24. So this is why we do informational interviews. It gets a foot in the door. It's low pressure. Uh, it's a chance to make a great first impression. We think the best way to make a good first impression is to not to share a lot of information about us, but to spend a lot of uh, as much of that time uh, learning about them. And we think if you come across as organized and professional when it comes to learning about their labor needs, we think that is, in fact, the best way to make a great first impression. And it starts that working relationship. And it starts the process of uncovering possible opportunities. Slide 25. So when we're approaching employers and building rapport, these are some of the conclusions that uh, we obtained from the employers that were involved in the focus group. Uh, Employers talked about the importance of that building and cultivating the relationship. And what you got to understand is they're on the back side of it. So, so they do recognize that when the questions were asked to them in such a way that we did learn their labor needs, that impressed them. Uh, and it developed trust. It, it, it was about, okay, they care about our company. They, they were earnestly trying to learn about us. If we're too quick to talk about a job seeker, what they think is we're job stuffing. And in a lot of cases, that's in fact what we are doing. We're making a lot of assumptions. We're anticipating what uh, they might need. And we're saying we have somebody that might be of interest to them. And they don't necessarily buy that. When you do a good job of learning about uh, their needs, is it, they, they, to them, that's synonymous with cultivating that relationship and building rapport. Uh, and then, what it really takes is if we do pay attention and really understand the criteria that they use for selecting and matching people to jobs, and we are able to do that, those employers tell us that's where the trust is de developed. And so that's why I asked those questions in the beginning.
Have you had success with customized employment? And I want to also ask you to think about how many employers would you feel meet this criteria, that you've had a decent job match? How many employers have you or your organization had successful job matches with? And however many employers that is, those are the employers you want to circle back with when it comes to conducting this type of an interview like we did. And that's what the, uh, the webinar, uh, the third webinar is going to be about, is how to conduct those interviews to really talk about that benefit that you've had to them. But it starts with one good job match. And a lot of times, we just place somebody into that job. We pat ourselves on the back, and we move on. And we don't necessarily develop and maintain that ongoing working relationship with those employers. And that, as far as these employers are telling us, is a mixed opportunity. Because once you have that successful job match, they have that trust that you, in fact, do know their labor needs and were able to find somebody to meet those needs. It happens to be a person with a disability, but in fact, that's not all that important to them from the standpoint of what they do. They know that the person meets their labor need, and that's what's most important to them. So they also recommended that we use a top-down and a bottom-up strategy to get that buy-in with the potential employer. We need to talk to the policymakers, which could be HR, could be executive leaders within those businesses. Those are the key decision makers. And those are the ones that are paying attention to the perception of risk. Those are the ones that may say no because they perceive risk when it comes to hiring a person with a disability. But when there's a successful job match, that's a successful foot in the door. And those policymakers, those decision makers, are now in a position to say, there, there was a perception of risk. They addressed my concerns about that risk. And now my experience with hiring people with disabilities is such that I see that the risk is no greater. In some cases, it's even less when it comes to hiring people with disabilities. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that just a little bit later in this webinar. Um, but they also suggest that you have to have that bottom-up strategy. When we say bottom-up, we're really talking about those coworkers that would work alongside the person that you want to place in that particular business. And they have to be comfortable and understand uh, why we're placing this person in this job and how and why this person's qualified. So asking some questions of coworkers and involving that coworker when we do the job matching and the support is very important because then they develop, you develop rapport with rapport with those coworkers, and they too uh, have the ability to kind of understand that there's some perceived risk, that that risk is being addressed, and in fact, this is a good working relationship. So if you use that top-down and bottom-up strategy, what the employers are telling us is they have a comfort level with the services that you provide. And then the question becomes, can we take full advantage of that rapport? That, that ongoing working relationship for additional job site, work site tours, job shadows, uh, maybe some community-based uh, types of assessments, and of course, some additional uh, placements that may meet some additional labor needs that those employers have. So these are employers who get it, and these are employers who are calling upon us to develop and maintain these relationships with these employers. And slide 26 uh, gives us some quotes about what it is uh, they, uh, they have to say when it comes to building that rapport. Uh, when it was a good job match, uh, it's the start of that working relationship. And what they say is that is so different than the job developer that says, here are a number of job applicants, and you decide which one you want to hire. A lot of times when employers are not happy with our services, it's because we haven't been conducting those informational interviews. We have just been sending our job candidates out to fill out applications. And then what happens there is we're not adding any value to this, to this process of that job seeker securing that 
position. We leave it up to the job seeker and the employer to figure out whether this is a good match, where in fact that should be our job. And we can only do that based on conducting those informational interviews at the start of that working relationship. And to share success stories, they talked about that. If it works for one employer, they pay attention to that, especially if it's an employer in a similar industry, retail, manufacturing, uh, wholesale, health healthcare. When, when, when we're successful with one employer, that means something to another. Another person talked about the fact that if it's a small company, they may not have HR or they may not have much in the way of an HR department. And when we can come in to learn their labor needs and we can save them time and money in the recruitment, training, and the hiring of individuals, and when we conduct those labor needs assessments that makes their operation more effective, we're in fact working with small businesses that don't necessarily have that expertise. And so that expertise of job matching, of conducting that labor needs assessments, um, those are things that we bring to the table for those small employers that they don't necessarily have uh, on their own. And that's where that quote about the veterinarian comes in. Uh, and when it works out in the end, you've, you'll be able to have that internal champion. And it's those champions that we want to conduct those follow-up interviews, conduct focus groups, so that they can articulate the impact that your services has had on those particular businesses. Slide 27. So when we uh, talk about labor needs assessments and customized employment, they don't necessarily relate to the concept of customized employment. They think, they being the employers, that customized employment is really a disability-related term. That's something that we use in our field. And we use it because we have found that to be effective, particularly, again, with placing folks that may not be able to, to fill posted positions. Um, but they relate to it as part of a con quali continuous quality improvement process. Um, and so we, we need to know that. We need to know, our, do they use such such uh, uh, a process? Um, and when they are using that to improve their overall productivity with uh, Lean, Six Sigma, ISO, um, then we're speaking their language. So just know that if you ask that question, do you use any kind of total quality improvement process uh, to reduce waste, to allow your operation to be more uh, 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 productive, more effective? Um, and they say yes, that's somebody that is a good candidate for customized employment. If they say no, you can still conduct a labor needs assessment, and you can say that you're using a total quality improvement methodology uh, that, in fact, if we find a good match, can improve their overall operation. So they relate to that. They want their operations to be more efficient. They want to reduce waste. And that applies not only to just manufacturing, which is where a lot of these uh, methods were first developed, but many uh, people in the healthcare fields use total quality improvement. Uh, in many types of different businesses, but they usually have to be of a certain size uh, where, uh, so in other words, the really small companies don't, but that's where our expertise to kind of look at their overall labor needs and the way that they deliver their products or services is something that we may have some really good ideas to allow those businesses to be more productive. Slide 28. Oh, and there's a picture there of uh, several people in a, in a working on an assembly line um, side by side. Uh, importance of labor needs assessments, uh, uh, these are their quotes. Let's do a cost savings project. Let's find a way to take this job that has secondary tasks and have it uh, done elsewhere or combine it with some other tasks so that the operation is better for everybody. Uh, what, what coworkers have said is when we use customized employment and we improve the overall productivity within that business, those coworkers benefit. A lot of times if they have people who are uh, not in their jobs, maybe because of a turnover, the extra workload goes on the people who are still there. So if we can come in 
and we can uh, identify and customize specific tasks that frees them up to be more productive, that improves the quality of their job, that coworker's job. And they, in fact, uh, have a higher morale, and they, in fact, have less turnover. So when so so where there's turnover in positions, that's a good opportunity for us to get in there, look at where there are inefficiencies, especially where there's inefficiencies based on people missing, uh, where there's uh, a vacant positions. Uh, another employer said the solution based on labor needs assessment solved the problem. And many of the things that plague an industry can be fixed with simple problem solving. So again, don't feel like you have to be experts in the areas of total quality improvement. But, but you can just look at this as every thing that is produced, every service that's provided, there's a process involved. When we do a lot of training uh, of employment specialists that transcend, we break everything down into those processes. What is the process for getting somebody a job? What is the process for conducting an informational interview? What is the process for doing good discovery and assessment? And know that these businesses have those processes. So the more we understand them, the more we can find opportunities for some of the folks on our caseload to do specific customized tasks that in fact solve problems, reduce waste, and benefit their overall operation. Slide 29. And this, again, is something that we sometimes dance around, but we really need to address directly. And that is, when, you, when they know we're, high, we're representing employees who have a disability, they have a perception of risk. And so these employers that we are able to interview during these focus groups, um, they are, have come through that process. They had those concerns, they had those concerns addressed, and it's important for them to tell us that you have to address this issue of perception of risk and we have to address it head on. It starts with a good informational interview. It starts with understanding their business and their operation, but it also is important that during the presentation, when we're, when we're making our pitch, when we're saying we think we have somebody for a posted position or a customized job, that we address what they might not say out loud is, is this going to add additional risk? And again, those decision makers in HR, those decision makers in terms of executive leaders in terms of the operation, that's what's on their mind. And so what they told us is that uh, not only do they have those concerns, but then when we address those concerns for a person with a disability, we in fact, in a lot of cases, address those concerns for others in the workplace. That when we make the, the workplace safer for the person that we place in there, we're making that Put that in that workplace safer for everybody. A lot of the things that we come up with that helps that person not get hurt or hit by uh, a forklift um, or uh, uh, drop something that's heavy, you know, those kind of accommodations, those type of jigs and uh, 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 ways that we support the folks that we work with have universal applications. And they, in fact, when an employer sees a way to make something safer, they make that safer for everybody. Because as you can, you'll see in one of the quotes, that's first and foremost on their mind. How do we reduce risk? And it's not just around working with us. They're, wor they're worried about reducing risk overall all the time. It's a primary responsibility that they have. So when discussing potential risks and finding solutions, um, Employers feel comfortable that it's not only exposing the liability for either the employee of the or the job coaches. Um, and and the, those accommodations and solutions to uh, addressing those risk factors is really what they're looking for from us. So you need to, during the informational interview, ask them about their perceptions of risk and how they would like us to try to address those concerns. A lot of times that will change the whole conversation because when you bring it up and you make them comfortable and willing to talk about, well, these are my concerns, 
it gives you the information you need to do an effective presentation and and you can in fact think about it and plan for how are you in fact going to address those issues of risk we do know that the hiring of people with disabilities in fact is not uh, causing that employer to be uh, uh, adopting more risk uh, there's been several studies uh, particularly through DuPont that have demonstrated that and so you can give them that information from the studies but it's also important to address it much more specifically within the actual workplaces that you are doing these informational interviews and and presenting possible job opportunities for the folks that you represent slide 30 these are some of the quotes that go with this, and I'm not going to read them all. And again, I want to emphasize because that was part of the questions that we got um, earlier was, can we get a hold of these slides? So yes, the slides are posted uh, with that link, and you can, in fact, download these. So you can read these on your own. But, what I, but some of these I like. Um, if it's an entry-level position, and if there's any risks involved, like somebody cutting themselves or somehow getting hurt in terms of lifting, um, uh, it, it, and if those are lower-paying types of entry-level jobs, uh, employer says cheap labor is usually cheap for a reason. There are substance abuse issues, historical issues. We're taking a risk by extending an offer to anybody. It's not just the individuals with disabilities. That's, in fact, their perceptions about most anybody that they hire, especially since a number of these folks don't turn out, don't work out, uh, where they, in fact, may have higher turnover kinds of positions. I think from a risk perspective, we have dismissed the risk and increased the profitability by looking at what's historically been an overlooked group of people who want to work and they're motivated. Uh, and in fact, some of the folks that we represent, they feel, have better uh, focus and are less likely to be um, uh, 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 getting hurt or taking on risk. And the quote is, nobody gets hurt the first day. When they've been here for a week, they say, I've got this. But they don't have it. That's why they get hurt. So what they're talking about is that entry-level person, they might not get hurt that first week because they're going to be careful and they're being told to be very careful. But then their mind wanders. They, they might be listening to music. They might be talking to a coworker, And they don't always stay as focused on the task as they should be, where, in fact, a number of the folks that we may represent are, uh, and what the employers are telling us is what they're experiencing, is they continue to pay attention and that they provide a better quality uh, because they understand that they need to constantly be paying attention. Once that entry-level person says, I got this, they, in fact, may not be paying as much attention as they should. So, in fact, when we match well, our folks reduce risk because we have folks that may be more focused on the job, and that's also the role of our job coaches is to help ensure that the folks that we represent stay focused on the task where their coworkers might not be as staying as focused on the task. Okay, slide 31. So conclusions from the study is that employment specialists use this information to build a business case for the employment services, including customized employment, and can build a trusting relationships with those employers. And when you have that rapport and when you have those employers that you consider to be those internal champions because they're comfortable working with you, they've had a positive experience hiring somebody with a disability, what they're telling us is uh, they, in fact, can uh, decrease exposure to liability and risk. And if you can get employers to say that, yeah, yeah, these folks have not represented additional risk. I thought they may. I was worried about it but they, in fact, do not, that's the best person to talk to another employer. So by conducting a follow-up interview, by learning what they think about your services and those perceptions of risk, those employers are your best uh, uh, messengers to other employers that you want to access to develop rapport and relationships with them, that business to business. And you can do that through testimonials, or you can, in fact, ask them to contact another employer 
Uh, and again, if they they value your services, a lot of a lot of times they're willing to do that. Uh, the neighbor needs assessments uh, is most effective uh, way to to uh, benefit those employers. They are telling us sell the fact that we come in to do these informational interviews. We're careful to learn their labor needs before we make any sort of pitch or presentation. And that if you can, in fact, do a, a more detailed labor needs assessment using quality improvement practices, and again, don't have to be experts in this, but you have to understand the basic concepts of how is something produced or a service provided, and where might we have uh, uh, the ability to in insert ourselves in terms of doing specific tasks that make that overall operation more productive. And those employers are telling us when we do it right, we do make their businesses more productive, and they save money on an ongoing basis. And the study has specific projections of, of cost savings and increased productivity uh, that you can use. And the white paper uh, for uh, this uh, study uh, should be coming out of the Department of Labor uh, very soon. And if anybody wants to uh, uh, make sure to get a copy of the entire study, uh, they can email me. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, keep those uh, email addresses and send them a copy of the study when it's released. Uh, slide 32. So the recommendations that came out of this, and I think these recommendations I think are particularly important for you uh, when it comes to thinking about how to approach and develop rapport for long-term working relationships. One is you have to be well trained in the areas of discovery assessment, job development, and workplace supports, including the concepts of customized employment. So I was glad to see that majority of you said you, in fact, have had some training in this area. Um, always can use more, and that's why I'm so glad that you've uh, uh, participate, decided to participate uh, in, this, in these webinars. So, uh, and, and to effective uh, communicators about the services that they have to offer uh, employers and the benefits of those services uh, and the impact. And, and you can use this report. You can use the slides from uh, the first and this webinar uh, to say the study's been done, the services we provide does have an economic impact with employers that have continued to work with us over time. And you can include that in marketing materials that you would use, that you can improve productivity and decrease costs. Uh, testimonials from those employers is a really good way to do that. Or conduct your own study. Uh, and that's, again, what the webinar uh, on August 6th is going to be about. Slide 33. The training for job developers, including customized employment, should include elements of quality improvement. And I know, particularly at Transcend, we're really paying attention to that, and that our training on customized employment, in fact, has those elements of quality improvement uh, that is used. We, we base our principles off of uh, lean. Um, but it's important for you to get some of that information. Uh, so that you can be more effective in conducting those labor needs assessments. And that it's an effective tool uh, to get employers to really kind of understand the services that you provide and particularly the use of customized job descriptions uh, and the fact that those, those job descriptions can increase productivity for the employers that you work with. And that those trusting relationships with employers at its core is providing solutions to issues, concerns, uh, uh, labor needs that those particular uh, businesses have. Every employer has labor needs. Every employer is challenged by uh, their workforce, either finding the employees to do the work. Uh, every employer would like to be able to hire more employees pay those employees more. They're all constrained by how much they have to pay for the labor that they need to deliver the product 
or service that they provide. The question is whether we can get in front of those employers and get them talking about what those labor needs are. It's how deep of a dive can we go with the limited time that we have face-to-face -face with these employers to learn those labor needs and learn about their operation uh, and, and where we can help them be more productive, more efficient. Uh, and if we can maintain that ongoing working relationship with those employers, uh, we can do that through uh, a range of recruitment and retention services. When we take uh, job seekers out, we might call it exploration or discovery. We may call that uh, uh, something, a service that we are doing on behalf of the job seekers that are on our caseloads. But we also have been very uh, uh, emphatic about the best place to do your discovery and assessment is not only out in the community, not in your workshop, not in your office, but also at the places of employment, at employer sites. So if part of having this ongoing working relationship with these employers is the ability to bring those job seekers that are on your caseloads back to those employer sites, just letting them see if you have a successful placement, letting your job seekers see this other person that you've placed working on the job, seeing the kind of tasks that they may be doing. Uh, employers don't see that as something you're doing for uh, the job seeker. They see that as a service that you're providing them. When you bring people by, you're exposing them to their place of business. They see that as a recruitment strategy. That's another way to develop an ongoing working relationship with those employers is worksite tours, job shadows, uh, time-limited short assessments, having a person come in to do uh, specific tasks, even testing these concepts of customized employment by having a job seeker come in for a limited period of time uh, doing the tasks, uh, showing the employer that this person can, in fact, do the tasks that are required. Uh, those are all services that are not only to the job seeker but to the employer, and they see it as recruitment strategies. When we come back and provide those ongoing supports and training, yes, it's, it might be for the job seeker, but it's also for the employer because when those folks get that level of support from our job coaches, they in fact are retaining those jobs longer than other people that they may hire. And they really do value, and that's what was talked about a lot in the first webinar, they value when any somebody state, when those retention rates are very important for them. Every time somebody gives notice, that's three to seven thousand dollars that that employer is going to have to spend recruiting, hiring, and training somebody to take their place. And if they have multiple vacancies, multiple folks that they're trying to find at any given in time, you're mul they're multiplying those costs by three to 7,000 for each one of those. And so we come in, we know their labor needs, we reduce the time and effort that they need to find qualified employers. We really need to maintain these relationships with with these employers. And we find the biggest barrier, uh, go to slide 34, please. We find the biggest barrier for developing those long-term working relationships with employers is simply keeping track of who those employers are. Because what happens, what we're finding, is when an employment specialist who may have been really good at his or her job and has developed rela strong relationships with those employers, when that person leaves your, your organization, a lot of times we don't keep track of that employer anymore. And that's what the employers are telling us. They, uh, some of them have had very successful customized employment placements, and then the person who placed them there has left, and the, and, and the employer hasn't, or the, the, the provider agency has never circled back to say, hi, my name is Jane, my name is Bill, I've taken the place of the employment specialist that you work with. I want to be sure I understand your labor needs. I want to maintain this working relationship. That simple uh, customer service strategy of maintaining 
contact with those employers is not what the employers are telling us being done uh, on a on a uh, constant or regular basis. So monitoring and tracking the, your customer base is a very important part because if you do that, it's kind of uh, out of sight, out of mind. If you have that list, you can continue to use that list when you get new folks on your on your caseloads. Uh, allows you to kind of maintain uh, contact with those employers. Uh, and maintain that ongoing working relationship with that employer. Uh, and that the, the accommodations that we make for the folks that we support uh, can be utilized by folks without disabilities in ways that does also increase productivity and reduce risk. So we have a number of services that employers are very clear. Uh, they find beneficial. They find it benefiting their bottom line. Um, the question is whether we can continue that rapport with those employers and expand upon it in ways that creates opportunities for more uh, uh, job seekers that are on our caseloads. How well are we doing developing and expanding our customer base? Slide 35. So. Getting towards the end of this presentation, here are some great resources um, that are available to you. Um, the LEAD Center has, uh, particularly when it comes to customized employment, has a, a significant amount of resources and things that you can download. And again, one of those first uh, recommendations was we need a well-trained uh, employment staff that are comfortable and confident when it comes to approaching and developing relationships with employers. That doesn't happen right away. That needs to take time, it takes training, and it takes support. So if any of you on this webinar are have the responsibility of supporting other either coworkers or uh, uh, employment specialists that you supervise, it's important that you provide resources such as what the LEAD Center or ODEP's uh, Employment First uh, Initiative uh, has to offer. Uh, and then ODEP also has this drive website that has additional resources that are specific to uh, employment services, particularly customized employment services. So uh, it's important that we help people understand that what they're doing benefits these employers as much as it benefits the job seekers that we work with. Are we spending uh, an equitable amount of time cultivating those relationships with employers uh, as we do cultivating those working relationships with the job seekers that we work with? Are we helping employment specialists become more comfortable approaching uh, employers, conducting informational interviews, making effective employer presentations, employment presentations that mitigate risk, that address their concerns about risk uh, when it comes to hiring some of the folks that we represent. And then once we have been successful with that job match, are we cultivating those relationships, are we cultivating those internal champions uh, to create additional opportunities, not only within that particular employer's site, but within other employers that those employers can help us provide access to uh, over time through these messages of, of, of we provide these employment services, these employment services benefit you, the employer. So what I want to do now is open it up to questions. I'm, if you haven't uh, submitted questions but you have them, now is the time to do it. Uh, know that if we don't get to all of these questions, that they in fact uh, that we will we will uh, we will do uh, uh, we will we will download them all. Um, I will get them. I will respond to all of the questions. We will upload that back onto the website. You will be sent a link uh, so that you can go to that website um, and you can open up the PowerPoint slides. You can also open up the responses to the questions that you have. So with that, I'll turn it over to Daryl to help us with questions from the from the group. 
And this is Maynard. At this point, you can enter your comments and questions in the chat or questions feature within the webinar platform. You can also email your questions at elearning at transcend.org. And I'll, know, I'll now turn it over to Daryl with questions. Okay. And Daryl, before you ask, ask that first one, I did want to say one more thing. I, I you know, you might have a lot of questions. Uh, you might want additional resources. We want to be there for you, um, and I and I mean that myself included. So feel free to contact us, and we would be happy to give you additional resources. We really want to support you in this effort of developing these relationships with employers. And for the for the folks that are on this webinar, that are from the we have a bunch of folks from the D.C. area, and um, want you to know that we are, uh, I want to encourage all of you to participate in the third of these series on August 6th at the same time, where we'll give you information about how to conduct these inf these type of interviews that I've just done uh, for uh, ODAP in the Department of Labor. But for the folks in DC, we're going to have a summary kind of debrief uh, uh, on August 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, where we will uh, kind of get your input in terms of the webinar series, uh, answer more of your questions that you may have, and kind of see how we can take some of these strategies and resources to better support you in developing these relationships on an ongoing basis. So if you're from the D.C. area, uh, please keep that uh, uh, conference call that we've scheduled for August 9th in mind. Okay, sorry, Daryl. Go ahead with the questions. No problem at all. Dale, we have some wonderful questions that the uh, audience has submitted. Uh, the first question is, how do you dif differentiate yourself from a temp agency with a fee? Ah, yeah, great question. Uh, and a lot of times, um, and, and I, I, I got to say, over my career, probably the thing that's most rewarding for me is 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 when when I training is you know I like I love to do training but what I love even more is when I can go out with employment specialists and meet with employers uh, contact employers conducting informational interviews or doing the presentations and and it's important that when you define yourself as an innovative staffing resource you use the word resource and and say that we are a non fee based innovative staffing resource so figure out a way to include non fee related so that they because that's a lot of times what they they think we may be and and i think it's okay for them to see us that way because i think that is you know we're, we're much more that than we are uh, providing human services when it comes to the perception of employers. So yeah, just make it or or just follow that up with and and uh, the fees that we get are not uh, applied to the employer. So in other words, you're saying somebody pays us for this, or you could even use the term we're government funded. We're a government funded uh, innovative staffing resource. Any one of those ways is a good way to make that clear. But that's a great question. I'm sure others had, had that question as well. Question number two. Could you provide more tips on how to deal with rejection from employers who are not open to customized employment? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, yeah, uh, okay, tips about that. Well, to me, it all comes down to the informational interview uh, and that first and best impression that you possibly can make. It's important when you're learning about their labor needs that you learn about all aspects of their labor needs. It's important to understand how the business recruits. It's important to understand how what their hiring process is. And not just, well, you post an application online, you you get a phone interview. If that goes well, you get a face-to-face -face interview. If that goes well, we do a second face-to-face -face interview, and then we hire you. I mean, we can assume a lot of that. What what we want to find out is not only when when somebody applies, what's the criteria they use to screen those applications? When they conduct the phone interview, 
what kind of questions and answers to those questions are they looking for? When they conduct those face-to-face -face interviews, what is the strategy for that interview? Um, and what questions do they ask? What answers to those questions are they looking for? And what I find is most employers are willing to share that information with you because it, the reason they should share it with you is that's what allows you to do effective job matching. And if they know that you understand what they're looking for, you can save them time and money in terms of that screening and recruiting and hiring process. So that's so it's so what I'm trying to say to you is don't start with customized employment. Start with that process of what are your labor needs? What are the kinds of positions that you have open? And you want to about two-thirds of the way through that informational interview, start to ask questions about their overall operation and unmet labor needs. What are the secondary tasks? So you, the best way to address their concerns or rejection around customized employment is with good questions. Good questions that get at operational inefficiencies, operational deficiencies. Uh, vacant positions and the impact of those vacant positions on the other aspects of their workforce. Get them openly talking about challenges and problems that they have. The more you can get them to talk about issues and challenges and problems, the more you have the opportunity to propose solutions. Um, if your question is, how do I address the rejection once I propose a customized job, you almost have to kind of reel it all the way back to the beginning and find out how what kind of information did you get. Because what I guess the way I look at it is they're rejecting your, your proposal of customized jobs based on the fact that they're not seeing it as beneficial to them or their operation or their bottom line. And there's probably a lot of different reasons why they may perceive that. One comes all the way back to the perception of risk. Did you uncover any perceptions of risk? Did you address any potential perceptions of risk? Because they may reject the concept of customized employment, but in fact it's about, I think this person has a disability, I believe I might be a uh, taking on additional risks that I otherwise wouldn't have to if I hire a person without a disability. But in fact, that person without a disability may not be a person without a disability, just not disclosed, and or just because they don't have a disclosed disability doesn't mean they don't have equal or in some cases more risk. So to me it comes down to risk, it comes down to did you uncover a business solution to a problem that they have. Um, and again, without getting into the specifics, but again, use us as resources. So whoever asked that question, if you run into that situation and you really want to debrief about that, know that you can email me, you can, you can contact us. We would be happy to walk you through something like that. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say about that is you're not going to be successful all the time. This is a very dynamic process. You have to think on your feet. The negotiation is the key part of this. What I'm really trying to get across through this webinar and the webinar before this is you have a lot to offer these employers. And if you can ask the right questions, and if you can uncover some issues that you can help them with, they'll not only get behind this, they'll be an internal champion for you uh, moving forward. That development of the internal champion isn't going to happen with every employer that you work with, but it can happen more often, and it comes down to good techniques when you're conducting, in, when you're approaching the employer, good techniques when you're conducting the informational interview, and this is most important, good techniques for presentation to the employer, which should always include a written proposal. So if they rejected your concept of customized employment, and if it was just presented verbally, 
And if you did not have a lot of really good supporting information that supports the concept that you presented, it's going to be much easier for them to say, I'm not interested, or not for us, or check with me later, or all those other things that they do when they do, in fact, reject our, our proposal. So without the specifics, I think that's the best I could do. But I think that's a, a heart of the matter kind of a question. So thank you so much for, for asking that. Question number three. Do you have an example of a labor needs assessment template? I'm very, very new information and would love to apply to my rural areas and services. Yes. So um, when we do training at Transcend, on, particularly on the employer engagement job development, uh, I mentioned that we have a process. We recommend a process for all of the steps in the job search process. Uh, so there's a job search process, and then there's a process for each step in the job search process. And that's how we train. So our tools also reflect that process. So what we have is an informational interview uh, uh, site notes tool. And what it does is it's, it's, a, it's a, a one and a half page document. It's got each section of that document takes you through what we think is the best way to conduct an informational interview. And it leaves space for you to write notes. So it takes you through the process of conducting the informational interview and gives you the ability to write uh, your inf what the employer says as you go through the interview with that particular employer. Um, we would be happy to send you the informational interview site notes tool. And we also have a, a kind of a universal set of questions that you can ask in each of the sections of the informational interview process. And I would be happy to send you both of those tools. Um, all you'd need to do is email me. And uh, my email address is included in these slides. Uh, and I would be happy to send that to you. Again, we want you to use these concepts. We want you to use these tools. Of course, we only have this 90 minutes together, so I can't give you a detailed training in this area. But I can send you a few tools. Uh, and there's a lot of resources. Uh, and those are at those links uh, that you have uh, that you've seen earlier. And then there's uh, Manners just put up my my email address as well. But thank you for that question, uh, Daryl. Is there more? Got one another one more. I would say uh, this one is: What should a provider do when they experience staff turnover? Providers do not want to lose their relationship with the employers? Yeah, great question. Because um, that's what's happening. And it's it's not only frustrating to me because I see the potential for this provider, any provider organization, to take the hard work of one employment specialist and build upon it with the next person and keep going. We should have a customer base of employers at any provider site that does nothing but grow. But it can only grow if we're maintaining the ones we have and developing new ones. Uh, and I don't see that happening. So I love your question, because obviously you're seeing the importance of this. It starts with keep track of your customers. The, employers are an equally important customer of our services. We do nothing but sit in the middle of those two customers and share information. That's our role. So how can we have files and files of information or, or pages and pages in a file of information on a job seeker and so little information about that other customer? So if somebody goes out and does an informational interview and learns about those labor needs, the first thing they have to do is write it down. And the second thing they have to do is put it in a place that the provider can access it. It can be as simple as a folder or a bulletin board, 
But of course, with technology being what it is, it can be an Excel spreadsheet. It can be uh, uh, it can be a very sophisticated uh, um, uh, app or or software that you use. Uh, it can be high tech. It can be low tech. But you have to have the names of the employers for whom you feel you uh, have them as your customer and have them as somebody that you want to maintain an ongoing working relationship with. So whoever asked that question, can you write down the name of the employers that you feel you have right now? And then can you start that list? And then can you get your organization to get behind maintaining that list and developing it further? And again, we have some tools that can, you know, it's, it's just a, it's just a, a, a paper document or an electronic paper document that where you can list your employers and who you've placed there and, and so forth. And again, we can send you information about developing a employer customer base or list. So. Uh, do we have other questions? Otherwise, I think I just have a few minutes left, and I, I could. Okay, great. Go ahead, Daryl. I think our employment services team needs more training on Lean and Six Sigma. Do you recommend a specific resource for training and or certification? So um, this is where it will vary from one training organization to another. So um, I, I uh, happen to be on the board of the ACRE Association, which is the Association of Community Rehabilitation Educators. And we have 27 training organization members who all issue, provide training and issue ACRE certificates. So that, to me, is the standard that we have in our country for training employment specialists. And we recommend that you get ACRE training and, and get ACRE certificates for your staff. To get an ACRE certificate, you have to have a minimum of 40 hours of instruction on, on uh, if it's the basic certificate with an emphasis on customized employment, there's 40 competencies associated with that. Uh, when it comes to Lean and Six Sigma, I don't know of other training organizations that are incorporating that into their, particularly it's module three on marketing and job development, uh, that we incorporate the concepts of Six Sigma, excuse me, Lean, uh, and total quality improvement. Uh, so Transcend can provide some resources. Um, if you emailed me, I could send you a couple, like, just slides and and resources on it. Um, but it's best if you get that training in in as part of job development training that you receive, which of course is offered through Transcend. Um, but if you want just a few resources on this, uh, I, I you can email me. I can get you started. Um, there is also, you can go to uh, various other websites on continuous quality improvement, Le Lean, Six Sigma. Um, I will also say that if any of you out there are involved with Project Search, uh, Project Search uses Lean concepts in some of their training of the Project Search sites. So in, in fact, Project Search does have resources in this area as well. So encourage you to find more resources on it. You can get it from us. You can get it from others. Uh, encourage everybody to get uh, ACRE training uh, as, as a way to identify the level of, of, of training that your staff have. Uh, and there's a lot of different ACRE trainers that are out there that you can get training from. This will be our last question for the day due to limited time. I am experienced with developing partnerships. 
I struggle with identifying areas to reduce risk and making the business more productive. How do I get better at that? Okay, well, the, the easy answer to that question is come to the third of the three webinar series, um, which is scheduled for August 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to go through the survey that we used to conduct the study that a lot of the information that I'm shared through these first two webinars is provided. Uh, these employers that we found were, were great. Uh, and, and it's because they've had a positive experience. So if what you are saying, you the person who wrote that question, is you have a good positive relationship with, an, with if you have a good positive relationship with four to six employers, I would strongly encourage you to uh, participate in the webinar three and conduct a focus group with those employers. And start with, did my services benefit your, you and your bottom line when it comes to recruitment, hiring, and support? And if they said, yes, you've did, you, you know our labor needs, you've done a good job of job matching, it's helping that employer look at us not as a human service provider who does just good things for people with disabilities, but who provides effective employment services, innovative staffing resources to you, the employer. And getting them to think about that through a focus group or an interview. So help them see you as providing services that do benefit them and benefit their bottom line. When it comes to mitigating risk or improving their productivity, sometimes that's through the concepts of customized employment. So I don't know if you've used customized employment with some of the, the employers that you work with, but if you did, you would add those questions to the questions that you would be asking um, when you conduct your interview or your focus group. When it comes to mitigating risk, was there any risks involved with them hiring a person with a disability? Heck yeah. They, they could be sued. Um, the job coach could get hurt. The person could get hurt. Um, did they get hurt? Did you take steps to ensure that didn't happen? And or did you communicate to the employer that you had a rider that you had a way to protect your job coach when they're on site. Those are all things that are examples of reducing their risk. And then when it comes to reducing risk in the workplace, did you do any accommodations? Did you make the employee, the employee that you work with safer in one form or fashion? If you say yes, then it's important to ask the questions to the employer in such a way that they say yes, and then, how can those services that I provided you be seen as mitigating some of that risk? So the short answer is we'll, we'll provide you more information about that uh, during this third uh, webinar, but also rethink how and what you've done for the employers who you have a good working relationship with because chances are they were worried, they were concerned, and now they're not. And if they were, and now they're not, you have, in fact, mitigated that risk. You've, you've addressed that issue. But we may not have circled back to ask them, well, were you nervous about this when the person started? Did you think because they had a disability, they might have a different experience than what they actually ended up happening? That's been our experience with these employers that we did for the study. And that's why I'm so excited about sharing the results of what these employers had to say with you. Thank you so, so much, Dale. You bet. Great, great, great information. Uh, we're at slide 38. Make sure to register for our next webinar, Employment Engagement Webinar number three, Assessing the Economic Impact and Benefit of Your Employment Programs. It's going to be held on August 6, 2019, from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.
Slide 39. About Transcend Incorporated. Transcend is a national organization offering web-based and in-person training for state agencies, school districts, provider organizations, and other interested meaningful work in community inclusion for individuals with disabilities. Transcend.org is one way you can reach us, or you can reach us at 301-424-2002 or inquiries at Transcend. Dot org. Finally, um, we will be sending you out some evaluations, and those evaluations really, uh, we need your input to kind of tell us what we can do to improve, what you found to be very valuable to you, and um, what other information you may need to continue growing within the industry that you're pursuing currently as employment specialists. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. We look forward to seeing you on August 6th. And again, thank you so much, Dale, for your insight and knowledge. Thank you, Daryl, and thank you, Maynard, for all your support on the webinar. Thank you.